the holiness of God. We live in such a culture where, how do I say this? properly and offend most of the people. We live in a culture where the name of God is used so irreverently in the church, by church people who say they love God. So you get a little bit of good news and your employer comes and says, well, you know, I just feel like having a good day today, so you're off tomorrow with pay. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! I got a day off. My question is, thank God for the day off, but why use the name of the Lord three times in vain? Every time I hear a Christian say something like that, I cringe. I literally cringe. There's one thing saying, oh God, I need a touch about my life. Oh God, I need a visitation. Oh my God, I didn't think I was so lucky. Church, that ought not to be so. And if you are in the habit of saying that, stop it now. For you're taking the name of the Lord God in vain. And not only that, you're forgetting that he's present and you have no knowledge of his holiness. I couldn't get away from this this, this incredible moment when suddenly... There was a heaviness in my spirit concerning the holiness of God. The holiness of God. We talk about the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the omnipresence of God, the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God. But first and foremost, God is holy. Even the Jewish culture was still not spelled the name Yahweh. They will, they will shorten it because they don't want to infringe upon the holiness of God. And the Bible says they are blinded. How much us as spirit-filled and spirit-Pentecostal people should be aware of the truth about the holiness of God. Wow. Wow. And you say, are we that bad? No. Sad to say, we're somewhat normal. But God wants to take it to another level. God wants us to walk in fear of the Lord. That don't mean hiding from the Lord. That means reverence. Simply reverence. Simply reverence. See, I believe Isaiah was an incredibly godly man. I believe Isaiah, in fact, theologians call him the prince of Israel's prophets. And I'm sure he thought he was doing okay until he got in the temple one day in the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, and he saw the Lord. Well, let's read it for a moment. First, in in Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord (coughs) sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his, his glory, that's what the word train means there, his glory filled the temple. He describes how, how, how the seraphims, the, uh, each having six wings and two covered the, his face, two his feet, and, and with two he did fly. 
In other words, the seraphims, they are a, a, a celestial being that ministers in the presence of God. They, they recognize the holiness of God, and, 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 and they, with two of their wings, they covered their, 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 their feet. And with two of their wings, they covered their face, and with two of their wings, they flew. What was that all about? It was an acknowledgement of the presence of God before them. And it was an act of reverence. An act of reverence. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. And then Isaiah, the prince of prophets, said, Woe am I. The word woe there is an incredibly powerful emotional word that says, that means a sudden realization. In, 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 in our parlance today and environment, it would be like going down the 401 and, and there's something ahead of you and you strike your brakes and there are no brakes. Whoa! And you're not talking to the car. You're just expressing the fact that something incredible is happening. Whoa! Woe is me, he said, for I am undone. Ex excuse me, Isaiah. You're undone? He said, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king of the Lord, of, of the king, the Lord of hosts. There's enough preaching material there, pastors, for us to spend a whole six-month period. It was, it, was, it was when he saw the glory of God that he realized he was unworthy. He was unclean. Now come with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. You say, yeah, that's just the Old Testament expression. That's just some kind of Hebrew expression. Well, let's come to the fifth chapter of the book of Luke. I haven't got time to read it all, but I'd love to read the first 11 verses. Came to pass that as the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genezareth, saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, or Peter, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he, and he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a, for a catch. Simon answered and said unto the master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let them down. When they had this, done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their nets break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which was John and James. Uh, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships that, so that they began to sink. Listen to the next two, three verses. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Wow. There's two men. One of the Old Testament, one of the New Testament. Who suddenly received this revelation of the holiness of God. Think about that for a few moments. See... What's kind of amazing to me, particularly in, the, in, in both passages, that, that Isaiah was such a, 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 a respected prophet in Israel. And secondly, when it comes to Peter, it appears that this was not the first meeting of Peter with Jesus. If, if you would notice that, that Peter, the first encounter we have with scriptures that Jesus and Peter got to know each other was in Luke chapter 4. When Jesus came to Peter's house and healed his mother-in-law. And John chapter 1 verse 42 records that. But it was 
it was, it was here in this text, in Luke chapter 5, that Peter truly recognized the holiness of Jesus. The holiness of Jesus. And Jesus was the reflection of God. He was truly God, but in the human he was a reflection of God. I, 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 you see, I truly believe that God is poised to do something through a person or a church when they can be trusted with the, with, with the revelation of His holiness. I believe that what stands between at the mighty revelation of the power of God is the state of the church. I could preach all day on that subject. You want to talk about people about taking a risk? Look at the risk that Jesus took when he went back to heaven and left evangelism to the church. Think about that for a moment. Think about it for a moment. So what I'm saying is as the church draws close to God, the more she will reveal the power of God to the world. And the more the world will be attracted to the power and the presence of God as the church finds her place in holiness. God is preparing us. We have seen incredible things even since we moved into this building, but incredible things in the old building. But I believe that God is wanting to take us to another level of his glory in our lives, but we must understand and reverence the holiness of God. If you say the name of God without it being an act of worship, you are blaspheming the name of God. Let me say that again and let me be clear. If you say, oh my God, because you're surprised at something, it better be a revelation from the Lord, because if it's not, it's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. Why do I preach this? Because I love God and I love you. And I want us to, I want us to not fall short of God's plan for us because we take spiritual things lightly. I want us to excel that God might use us for his glory and for his honor. And that God can trust us with his name. Mm. That God can trust us. And I, I, I've, just, I've just noticed it in the last number of years. I've just noticed the name of God being taken by what I call respectable Christians. And, and you know, I, I just believe that they have been deceived by the culture in which they live, in the place in which they work, and even sometimes in the church they attend. God is holy. And his name is holy. And when we speak it, we speak it with reverence or we speak it with great respect or fear because we understand the dynamic of the name that we're using. I never hear people swearing by any of our great prime ministers or any of the great presidents of the United States. But I frequently hear God's name used in the most light way. Where did that come from? It came from a, 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 a snare of the enemy. It came from a cultural shift that's happened over time where, where we don't see God anymore now than just a big, big 
aged man in heaven who's just waiting to give us something. And he becomes our go-to guy when we're in trouble. An old friend of mine who's gone to be with Jesus now, when he preached like this, and they were silent, he said, well, you can't talk and eat at the same time. I trust you eating this morning. And so, you see, up to this moment in Isaiah's life, he was just the prophet of the Lord. He was the prophet of the Lord. But now when he saw the glory of the Lord and in light of God's glory and holiness, he realizes his sinfulness. Is it possible that some of us don't want to draw close to God because we have our pet sins and we don't want to be reminded about them? Think about that for a moment. You begin to push through with God and you get intense with God and God reminds you of something that you need to tidy up and you back off. You back off. You don't want to go there. Isaiah, I don't know what Isaiah's unclean lips was. I have such an incredible impression and view of Isaiah all my life as a Bible student and pastor that I, I don't know what his problem was. I don't know. But this one thing he, he did give us a clue on, that he was guilty of unclean lips, and his nation of Israel was guilty of unclean lips. And I can only think of one thing, that they were giving lip service to Jehovah. And in giving lip service only, it became an abomination in the eyes of God, and Isaiah called it unclean. Wow, think about that, church. Is it lip service only that you give to God? Is it just a practice to come to the house of God once a week to do your time? Almost like someone going to prison for a misdemeanor. Got my time done now. Or is it an all-out service of the king of kings. See I, see, I just get this impression that Isaiah was not a cusser. And I don't think Isaiah was a blasphemer. But somewhere in, in that moment in the presence of God's holiness, he realized that there were some things that were hypocritical and, and not real, and I including... The language that he used, and I'm talk, not talking vulgar language, the language that he used in relationship with God. The first thing he said, I have unclean lips. I have unclean lips. When we use our lips, we're really, the, 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 the lips is the window of the heart. The eyes are the window of the soul. And I'm not sure there's a, lot, a whole lot of difference. But when we use our lips, what comes out of the mouth reflects what's in the heart and the mind. What goes into the mind through the eyes determines what kind of mixture comes out of the mouth? He said, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of unclean lips. Every time I speak with my lips and tear down someone's character, I am engaged in unclean lip activity.
Every time I criticize and tear down someone's character or someone's personality or someone's work, I engage in unclean lip language. Every time I repeat the truth with the intent of stirring up a hornet's nest and hurting somebody, I'm engaging in unclean lip activity. God has established forums and means and ways to deal with things. But when we with gossip just share thoughts and ideas and things we think we saw and things we think we heard and we're not quite sure, we are instilling in the hearts of somebody else doubt and trouble. And what we're doing, we're engaging in unclean lip. Mm. Unclean lips. So Isaiah at that moment realized when he saw the glory of the Lord and the light of God's glory and God's holiness, he realized his sinfulness. See, God was taking Isaiah to another level. And so when he saw the glory of God, he realized it. And that's the reason why I want to see the glory of God because any impurities in me, I want them out of me. Amen. So that God can use me for his glory. I want to be immersed and surrounded by the glory of God that I might shine for his glory. Oh. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. My, my nation is a man of unclean lips. You see, Peter, he recognized the holiness of God that morning when, when Jesus uh, performed the miracle of the fishes and, and, and he said he said he said he saw the glory of Jesus in that moment and he said get away from me get away from me I'm a sinful man but before that before that Peter was in his house Jesus was in his house healing his mother-in-law folk my spirit is stirred when Christians get together and talk about things they don't know about. And it doesn't have to be accurate. They just got to get it out there and let it do its dirty work. You are engaging in our unclean lips and God is not pleased with it. And if you're repeating something true just to hurt somebody, that's double worse. That's double worse. See... We have this incredible, and I'm not, I, 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 I know I'm not through my text yet, so. We have this incredible ability to compartmentalize our lives. I never ran into that concept until Bill Clinton had the trouble with Monica Lewinsky. And the most brilliant psychologist and the most brilliant Counselors in, in, in the world tried to work with the, the government and work with the, 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 the mess that he created with that lie. And they came to this conclusion. And those of you that, 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 that are trained in counseling have heard this term for sure. He had the ability to, to compartmentalize his life. So there were three or four Bill Clintons. There was a Bill Clinton that was the president of the United States. There was the Bill Clinton that was the husband of, of Hillary. And there was a Bill Clinton that was the father of Chelsea. Chelsea. Then there was the Bill Clinton who nobody had any, had any right to know. And then there was the Bill Clinton that entitled himself to anybody he wanted because he was a man of power. 
And I will never forget when they did the, I mean, I've never seen anything like it in my life. When he looked into the camera and said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. And in his mind, he was 100% correct. Because he defines sexual relations different than how it should be confined, defined. Or defined, rather. And he never did really confess. He got impeached. The rest is history. There's Christians in this church this morning. In the spiritual realm, you're no better than Bill Clinton. I'm not here for your approval. I'm here for his approval. You can hide behind your actions. You can, you can say your words and then say, well, uh, hey, to yourself, when your spirit gets a little bit conscious, you know, that, that's not correct. Well, you know, I'm just telling the truth. Well, you know, that's what I heard. It's not my fault. It's Brother Sons' fault who told me. I'm just repeating what I heard. And do you feel okay about that? You are sinning and you are denying the presence of God and you are ignoring the holiness of God. And it's time for you to stop. Because God got something better for you. And he's got something better for this church. He's got a destiny for us. But if we're, if we're going to go to the next level, we are going to have to recognize the holiness of God. I walked in the prayer room, and God began to deal with my spirit along this very line about the holiness of God. And we have been seeing some incredible things in the last number of weeks. And, and, and with Sister Marie coming, and then Brother Sam coming, just, just, just taking it to another level, and, and, and God honoring. But what God has shown me is that he wants to take us way beyond that. And the next step, he showed me in my spirit, the next step is that we begin to recognize the holiness of God. Not just on Sunday, but seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Dad, you need to demonstrate holiness before your children. You need to demonstrate holiness in your relationship with your wife. You need to demonstrate holiness in your relationship with your employer. Not because, there is, not because there's a list of rules in the front office, but because you have a relationship with God. And you and God together, striving in holiness, is way above the mandatory laws of the employer or the mandatory expectations of a society that's already broken. Don't live by the culture of the society or by the limitations of society, that's so far down in this day and age that you got to look up. This is the Word of God. This is the holiness that God has called us to. Oh, thank you, Father. See, when we, like Isaiah and Peter, are all with sinful nature, we, 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 when, we, when we come before God, and, and surrender and give heed to what God is saying to us. There's some in this spirit in this church this morning have already shut your ears down to this message. And some of you are receiving it with, 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 with thankfulness to the Lord. And it's going to change your life. It's going to change your life. If we will come into the white hot holiness of God and allow God to just purify and cleanse us and take us to the next level, only the Lord knows what he would do through us. Through us. And that's all it is. We're just a conduit for God to work with. A conduit. So three things happen when we get caught in that 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 that. that if I use the word crossfire, you've heard it before. When we get caught in that crossfire of God's holiness, three things happen. We realize, number one, we're not as good as we thought we were. You know, 
You know, the devil is never stops, he never stops trying to find ways to mislead us and to, and to deceive us. And one of the ways is to not condemn us. We have, we have catastrophe after catastrophe in the Christian ministry and the Christian church that have bought into Satan's lie, you're doing okay. The church couldn't get along without you. You're doing such a good job. Well, you know, Satan, I never did think you could tell the truth, but hmm, in this case, you m might be. If the devil is congratulating you on how well you ought to do, hit for the prayer room and get the disaster stopped before it happens. See, when we, when we encounter God's holiness, we, we, realize, we realize that we're very vulnerable to all that's around about us. We realize that there's a greater power around us. And we realize that we need cover. God is calling us to holiness, and we can't get there until we understand the holiness of God. Let me say it again. God is calling us to holiness. But we can't get there until we understand the holiness of God. And the whole scriptures talks about holiness and holy living. And I could spend the rest of the day here. I could spend the rest of the day here in church. I am, I am troubled with this concept. Troubled, and yet I'm encouraged. God, have mercy on the church where the church is not where God wants it and the pastor don't know it. You see, the letters to the churches in Revelation was written to the pastors, to the angel or the leader of the church, not to the people. Not to the people. And I'm not one that meddles in people's personal problems or personal situations because that would be a, a, a trick of the enemy to sidetrack me from what God has called me to do here. But I do have my spirit in tune to the spirit of God. And I'm hearing some things. And he's asking me to deal with it through the word of God, not through my personal opinion. Through the word of God. See, we cannot be contented with being just saved. But we must be loosed from the grave clothes as, as Lazarus was that binds us from spiritual freedom and fullness. And the first step in that is to recognize the holiness of God. Well, you know, I want to tell this dirty joke, but, well, this joke, but the pastor's around, so I can't say it. I believe I've had an experience like that where I wasn't invited to a get-together because the folk planning the party of Christians, in a lot of cases, probably knew that there was going to be some well, not proper things said or done. More afraid of the pastor than God. Now, that's a commentary on a Christian's walk, isn't it? I know I'm digging deep, folks. But every stroke I make is made with love because I want to see you excel. I want to see you excel. I just know that God has destined us. I just know that God has, is dealing with us. I know that God is wanting to take us to another level. But there's something in my spirit that says we need to recognize the holiness of God. Folks, I'm tired of 
stories that I've heard from sons and daughters in my ministry and from around. When I talk about their dad or their mom, about a big, great Christian, you can tell it's a cutting, cutting, and they'd like to be able to say, Pastor, you don't know. That happens. What a travesty. What a travesty. What a travesty. What are your children hearing around the, the dinner table about God's people? Are they being lifted up or are they being criticized? Are they being encouraged or are they being discouraged? I would challenge every one of you to go back from last Monday morning until last night and examine what flowed from your lips and what was of value and what was of no value. What built up and what tore down. What seeds of discontent may have been sown by a word spoken with intent. What binds us today from stepping into the glory of God the, the way that Isaiah saw it? What binds us today from being in that moment when Peter, who was called of God and worked with Jesus and, and was there, and suddenly he realized, oh my, I'm sinful, and what am I doing in the boat with this man called Jesus? God, give us a fresh revelation. God, give us a fresh revelation of the holiness. Oh, God. Oh, God. A fresh revelation of your holiness, God, so if we, if we misspeak and all of a sudden there's a conviction in our spirit and we cry out for forgiveness. Lord, tell me, help me to keep my mouth shut and my mind clean and my thoughts pure before you by the grace of God because I walk in the presence of holiness. Whether there's someone around or there's nobody around, I walk in the presence of holiness. God sees me in my car. He sees me in my home. He sees me in my nighttime. He sees me in my daytime. God sees me. God hears me. That's just as frightening. Oh, my God, how many of us are deceived by the devil to think that we're just, we're just repeating something. Peter said, I'm a sinful man. I don't know what Peter's sin was. I don't know. But suddenly, in the presence of, Almighty, of, of, of deity, who was Jesus, he felt so unworthy. We can be ob oblivious to the Spirit of God in our lives all week and do things displeasing to God. And we can walk into this sanctuary and the glory of God comes down and we just stand there sometimes and do nothing because we're dead, dead in our spirits. Or we engage in the worship and think we're doing okay. Folks, abomination to God. And God loves you enough to send this preacher who's bold enough by the grace of God and by the strength of God to preach it to you. And I tell you, God's got something better for you. He's got something better for you. God's wanting to purify and clean the church because you know why? He wants to bring the brokenness of the world in here so it can be healed. It can be healed by the power of God. But I believe that sometimes the healer needs healing. And to say, hey, that's what God wants in our hearts, in our lives. Oh, Lord Jesus. Sometimes we use religious talk to cover up our intent and religious talk to, to impress others when really our intent is to make somebody look bad. They were both, Isaiah and, and Peter, aware of, their, of, of two things, their sinfulness and God's holiness. And God's holiness will certainly help us to become aware of that. 
we, we sometimes, as believers, compartmentalize our life. I said earlier, I'm skipping over some of my notes. In church, there's one personality. Outside the church, there's a whole different personality. Listen, Jekyll and Hyde come to church every Sunday morning. They just put on different jackets, same mind, same spirit, and same body. The body of Christ is called to be much more pure. I'm not preaching just this morning because I'm perfect. I'm still a work in progress. I'm still surrendering to the Lord. I'm preaching it this morning because God has put it in my spirit to preach. Let me just walk on through a few more. See, the truth is, God wants to use every one of us. Well, we got a great pastoral staff. God is using them. Oh, we got a great music staff. God is using them and music. Yeah, that's right. We got a great teaching staff in our education ministries. God is using them. That's right. You ever think he might want to use the majority of you who's not involved in any of those three things I just talked about? Ever think that you go places that none of those three categories I just said will ever go? And you are to be a reflection of God there. A reflection of God. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he, he went and, and prophesied. And when Peter saw the Lord and, and fell at his knees, G Jesus said, okay, Peter, I understand where you are. Get up. You're going to catch many people. You see, the secret to seeing the Lord is the desire to get close to Him. And again, that desire cannot be compartmentalized. Well, Pastor, I have this great desire on Sunday morning to get close to God. But I'm not getting involved with anything. Not, don't expect me to the prayer meeting. Don't expect me to the Sunday evening. Don't expect me to the midweek. Don't expect me to this. Lord, I, I, got, I just have this great desire on Sunday morning. You are being fooled, my friends. You are being fooled and you are being robbed. God has a purpose for every time we come together. We come to worship. We come to learn. We come to be exposed to the Spirit of God as a fellowship. And God works in that culture. And the other truth is, if I'm truly saved, I want to be where God's people are coming together. Amen? Amen. I want to be at the prayer meeting. I want to be in the Sunday time services. I want to be where God's people are coming together if I am truly desirous after God. Now, does that mean sometimes you might be weary? That's true. That's okay. Sometimes you're really, really wore out. That's okay. But this habitual ignoring of the coming together of God's people is an indication of where you are spiritually. And I have no regard for who I'm hitting this morning. I'm being very transparent with you. I'm being very fatherly. And I'm being very honest with you. Some of you need to examine your position before God. Because God has given you some giftings. God has given you some abilities. And he wants you to use them for his kingdom purposes. And I'm afraid one day when you stand before him. That talent you have is going to be taken and given to someone else. And I leave your destiny to God. Beth Moore, in one of her books, said, I've certainly never experienced an encounter like Isaiah or Peter. But I have assuredly faced moments of such stark re realizations of my own sin that I felt unbearable pain. Interestingly, these moments did not come during times of rebellion, but rather they came during close encounters with God when I drew close enough to get an eyeful of myself. I thought that was very insightful. Until I take time out and have a solid look at myself, I won't see what I am. Only I know myself. You don't know me. Only you know yourself. 
I don't know. But in our practices, in our ways, in our lifestyle, we demonstrate who we are. We demonstrate who we are. Our Facebook page usually defines our priorities. Love me now? I have yet to see a lot on anyone's Facebook, and I don't watch it very much. But what little bit I encounter, I don't see a whole lot about Oh, what a time in the presence of God we had. Oh, what a sense of God's presence. Oh, God showed me how that he loves me and, and he's got to work for me and, and, and that I'm saved, but there's some things in my life that need to be corrected. God's been showing that to me, and I'm so glad for God doing that in my life. I don't see a whole lot of that on Facebook. Do you? Salamina, do you know a good trucking company? I may have to get out of here. <laughs> it's time, church, for us to see the holiness of God. It's time for us to see the holiness of God. There's much more, but I, I, I won't detain you. See, in the New Testament economy, the call to see the glory of God and to encounter God is always a call to service. I can tell you the people that have had an encounter with God. They're saying, Pastor, can I pray? Can, 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 I, can I be involved, Pastor? Look, look, I can't do a whole lot, but there's, please call me. I'm ready. I'm ready. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to catch fish. And that encouraged Peter, and he stuck with Jesus. Now, did he have a few failures? Yes, he did. One colossal. But he ended up dying on a cross. Peter did. And when they, the history tells us that when they told him he was, he was crucifying him, he said, I have one request. And they said, what's that? He said, crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my master was. <laughs> history records these as his, one of his final words. Hmm. Call to service. The musicians are coming back. If you want an encounter that leads to a, a life called to holiness and service to the Lord and not to yourself, then don't seek an experience. Seek Jesus. Amen. Seek Jesus. We are so grateful for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're so grateful what God did here on Friday night. We're so grateful what God's been doing here over the months. Uh, but look, these experiences are incredible, but they have been given to us for one purpose, to increase our intensity, to know Jesus Christ, uh, and to see the glory of God, and to be effective in what God has called us to do. Oh, my Lord, somebody hear me this morning, that God has a plan for us, and I don't want that to be aborted. I want us to bring the birth, amen. I feel pregnant in my spirit. I feel pregnant in my spirit. I feel like God has impregnated us, and now he wants us to walk in view of his holiness and in knowledge of his holiness so that we can give birth to what God wants to do through this people here this morning. Somebody say amen if you believe it. Oh, my God. I don't want to have a miscarriage. I want to give birth. 
so that the glory of God can be seen and the neighborhood can be reached and the town can be stirred and the city can be turned upside down and the province can be changed and the country can have something to hold on to and the worldwide missions can see the glory of God. That's what's in my heart and that's the potential God has given this congregation here at Peel Pentecostal but we must see the glory of God and we must see the holiness of God. I'm convinced, church, God wants to show us his glory when he knows he can trust us with his holiness. Somebody say amen if you believe it. Oh, hallelujah. Master, lead us in that song. I cry, holy, holy, holy Lord. How awesome is your name. And if you don't have the lead, please don't. I want you to fill these altars and I want you to fill these aisles. And say, oh God, Oh, God. Oh, God, show me your holiness. So that, Lord, when I'm about to misspeak, I am stopped by the Holy Spirit of holiness. So when I'm about to gossip, I am stopped by the Spirit of holiness. When I'm about to whatever, I'm stopped by the Holy Ghost. And whenever I'm going to tell a, a colored joke or a filthy joke, I'm stopped by the holiness of God. That's the awareness of His presence. Amen. That's the awareness of His presence. You see, presence and holiness is not just vague words. They are incredible dynamics of the Spirit of God who wants to instill it in the hearts of His people. You hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? Would you stand, please? Would you stand, please? See, you'll be changed. In the presence of a holy God, you will be changed. I am changed. In the presence of a holy God, I will be changed. And I'm in the presence of a holy God. we got to live in the presence of God. Oh, Peter, I love him. And he walked shoulder to shoulder with, with Jesus. He had Jesus heal his mother-in-law. He was right next to him. But that day on the Sea of Galilee, he's an experienced fisherman. He'd fish all the proper times and all the proper places. And so he didn't want to embarrass Jesus or belittle Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, Peter, drop your net, man. Peter said, we've been at this all night and there's not a fish in this lake. Fished all the good spots, boy. Off that rock, down around the point, out on the shoal. No fish there, Jesus. Jesus said, put your nets out. Peter said, Jesus, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. You don't fish at 11 o'clock in the morning. Late at evening, early in the morning. That's when fish are on the move. Jesus said, Peter, drop your net. I can, knowing Peter a little bit from my study of Peter, I can see this. Peter looking at, at his buddy, Andrew, his brother, and said, Go ahead, Andrew. Boy, this is going to be embarrassing. Load a crowd in there watching us. We're putting our nets down 11 o'clock. But go ahead. And all of a sudden, they dropped the nets. Peter said, Okay, Andrew, start pulling them back. He said, Peter, can't get them back. What do you mean, can't get them back? They won't come. I've been there, those guys. I know what I'm talking about. Peter said, oh, snagged on the bottom. No, no, it doesn't seem like it's, it doesn't seem like it's snagged. It just seems like, I don't know, just, Peter, it seems like there's fish in them. Peter says, Andrew, let's pull them up. And they pulled it up. And the fish start coming in. And here's what Peter was all embarrassed about. James and John was in a boat just one side of them. They're fishing partners. And that's the reason why, one of the reasons why Peter was embarrassed when Jesus had put nets down. And so they called out to James and John and said, come on over here. We got fish. And they said, what? We got fish. And suddenly it dawned on Peter. Oh, master, master.
master, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful man. Jesus, get out of here. You got to understand something, folks. Jesus is in our midst, and he's calling us to holiness.